and always happy uh, to do things tied in with Beaver Island, uh, one of my favorite places uh, to visit. So hopefully a summer visit this year uh, to get us back out to the island. Um, as Lori mentioned, I have been writing for many years and presenting on a variety of topics. And I actually started to learn about lighthouses back in the late 90s when I was working for an organization in Grand Rapids called the West Michigan Tourist Association. And my first project with them was this magazine, which has been scaled back to just a map now. Um, but the Lake Michigan Circle Tour and Lighthouse Guide, and it encompasses an 1100 mile route around Lake Michigan. And inside of this magazine back then, there was a chart of all the lighthouses on Lake Michigan. And my first project with this organization was to catalog all of those lights from uh, down in New Buffalo, Michigan, all the way around the lake, up through the Upper Peninsula, through Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. And I made this um, spreadsheet that told the lighthouse name, the city it was located in, uh, whether it was an active light, whether it was open for tours, did they have a museum? Could you uh, spend the night there? There are all these different uh, categories and this was very early on in the internet. Um, and so I did a lot of this by calling um, and talking to various historical societies and communities and gathering this information about the lighthouses along Lake Michigan. And I would often ask, what else should I know about your light? And a lot of times I got some really great ghost stories, which uh, I have a book called Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses, which talks all about those stories. But I also received a lot of information about women who were serving in the lighthouse industry here in Michigan. And I became incredibly fascinated with that story. Um, lighthouse keeping in Michigan started in the 1820s when the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse was built in Port Huron. And that was just 12 years after Michigan became a state. And these lighthouse keepers were government appointed positions. They were often appointed by the president, the president of the United States. And we saw a lot of um, late in later years, civil war veterans who would serve in the lighthouse service. Um, our first woman shows up in Michigan in the service in 1849. And I think that's incredibly significant because you have women working in a government job alongside of men uh, in a physically demanding job, such as Lighthouse Service was, and they were making equal pay. And just all of those things together, the fact that women were even allowed in and allowed to serve and to, to have such a, a, an important responsibility on the Great Lakes, I think is incredibly significant. And to, to be able to earn an equal pay with their male counterparts, and in some cases, even um, working as the boss of men, which was also virtually unheard of. Now, lighthouse keepers in general back in the mid 1800s, they earned only about four or $500 a year as a salary. So it wasn't incredibly lucrative uh, as a career. By comparison, a school teacher in that time period made about the same, but a postmaster who was also a government appointed position would make anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000. And I also was kind of intrigued by that because, you know, to me, uh, being a lighthouse keeper is much more uh, physically demanding, much more dangerous, much more remote than being a postal worker uh, working in a post office, you know, in your uh, in your town back in that era in the general store or in the hotel or whatnot. Um, so they didn't particularly get paid well. Um, however, keepers, men and women were given access and the house to live in and they didn't have to pay rent or uh, rent a house in town. And so there were some perks to the job uh, that make that lower salary, um, I guess, more manageable. Plus they also worked uh, about nine or 10 months out of the year and they worked 24 seven. So they didn't have a lot of time to just run around and spend money and travel and do things like that. So these, Michigan itself has close to 50 women who have served uh, sometimes for just a couple of weeks and sometimes for multiple decades in the lighthouse service. 
And so these are the women that we're going to, um, that I'm going to introduce you to today. And we're going to start in the southwest part of the state and make our way up through Lake Michigan and then on uh, into the uh, Lake Superior and then coming down and finishing out with our last few lights in Lake Huron. So this is the White River Light Station in Whitehall. And this lighthouse wasn't even complete when Bill and Sarah Robinson came to this area from England. They arrived in the 1860s with seven of their eventually 13 children. And Bill Robinson set out right away to have a lighthouse built in this town. It, like many uh, towns along the, uh, the Lake Michigan shoreline, were big into lumbering. And particularly in the early 1870s, after the Great Fire of Chicago, they were harvesting wood in this area to help rebuild Chicago. And so Bill Robinson, who's the second from the right in this photograph in the uh, black uniform, he was uh, taking daily records of all of the ships coming in and out of the White River and sending that information off to the lighthouse service so that he could prove the need to have a lighthouse built here. And in 1875, when the light was finally constructed, Bill was hired as the first keeper and he and Sarah moved into the light with their children. Now, three of their children died as, ch as kids um, and uh, they had some of the older kids had already um, kind of aged out and moved out on their own by the time some of the younger children came around. Sarah helped Bill with keeping duties as did the children. And that was also a very common thing for these female keepers, uh, for keepers in general with their families. Because if a lighthouse keeper, a male keeper fell ill or was injured in any way and could not perform his duties and didn't have an assistant keeper on staff to help, that keeper would not only lose his job, he would lose his salary and the family would lose their home. And so it was, it became much like a family business where the, the, the wife and the children would step up and help out uh, to make sure that the job was done. And so Sarah helped out in that capacity until 1891 when she passed away. Now Bill lived another um, 20 plus years and passed away at the White House um, in 1919. And both Bill and Sarah are said to still reside at White River Light Station. Now this lighthouse had actually three women with key ties to the lighthouse service. And the next we have Frances Gilmer Worry. She was married to Leo. He was um, a military man and it was in the 30s when the, the US Lighthouse Service transferred the lighthouses over to the Coast Guard. And so Leo came in as, a, a, he was still a, uh, a military guy, but kind of, um, phasing into this, uh, this civilian type of lighthouse keeper. Francis came in and she assisted him. And I read an interview uh, that was done with her within the last 10 years, where she said that he really didn't do much of a job anyway, that she took on most, most of the responsibilities while they were there. Uh, when they came in in 1944, he was more fond of going fishing and doing other things. Um, they ended up actually getting divorced in 1948 and she briefly left the service, but then petitioned as a civilian to return. And they gave her that position again. Um, and she eventually married a second time. Um, and I believe that ended in divorce and then married a third time. And then she ended up leaving the service shortly after um, having her one and only child, Holly. And uh, earlier this month, when I was giving this presentation, uh, Holly jumped on the Zoom. And we got a chance to talk at the end of the program, which is really kind of neat. Um, I've met Frances. She was just this spunky lady. I actually just absolutely adored her. And um, I met her in Whitehall when we were both um, guests at a presentation of the female lighthouse keepers. And uh, she has another claim to fame in that in the 1950s, she was on the game show, What's My Line, uh, the TV game show. And she actually went to New York City. She was a contestant on the show. The panelists had to ask her a series of questions to try to determine her profession. And the closest that they got was that she was a government employee. And they, they I mean, I can't imagine anybody that would really think you're, a, you know, guess a lighthouse keeper as a profession on that TV show, especially in the 1950s. Um, but she stumped the panel and she won a $50 prize, which is the check she's holding in that photograph. Um, 
And at the end of this presentation in the chat, I'm going to put a link to that video. It's on YouTube. I found it just a couple of years ago. And uh, she's the first contestant, so you can watch the first five or six minutes and see uh, her participation in that. Um, but I got a chance to meet her in Whitehall. She, a friend of mine who does um, a TV station program in Grand Rapids, did an interview with her. And uh, she outlived her, all three of her husbands and uh, passed away um, in uh, 2011 in Whitehall. She was 89 years old. And in this last interview, she still, I mean, she retired and went on to other work, but she talked so fondly about her service as a lighthouse keeper and how it really was one of the most passionate things that she had ever done in her life. Um, the photograph on the bottom shows another woman standing next to Francis, and that is Karen McDonald. And Karen uh, came in in the early 1980s at White River Light Station. And at this point, it was uh, operating as a museum. And she and her son ran the tours and the museum, and she took care of the gift shop. And she held that position until 2012 when the light was uh, transferred to ownership of the Sobble Point Lighthouse Keepers Association, which is based in Ludington and also manages. A big Sobble Point Lighthouse, Little Sobble Point Lighthouse and Mears, and the Ludington North Breakwater Light. Um, so obviously with Michigan and its many islands, that gives us a whole nother type of lighthouse. South Manitou Island is accessible by ferry boat out of Leland, and it is part of the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, which was established in 1970, which also includes North Manitou Island. And this shows, I love this map. If you've not been to South Manitou, uh, it is a remote um, island. No one actually lives there any longer, um, but you had a lot of farmsteads in the 1860s and they had a cemetery, a one room schoolhouse. They had a Coast Guard station. They had the lighthouse that was there. About 200 residents lived on the island at that time period. Uh, so when the lighthouse was built in the 1860s, it was a significant lighthouse because the, the um, harbor here in, in South Manitou is incredibly deep and a lot of ships would take refuge here if the weather turned really bad on the route between Chicago and Detroit. And they would also stop in and of course pick up uh, cordwood or other items that they may need um, in this area. So the lighthouse was very significant and it's an incredibly tall lighthouse. I think it's 117 steps to the top of the tower. Um, and so we had one of the noted keepers was a husband and wife team, Aaron and Julia Sheridan. And Aaron was a Civil War soldier. He um, lost the use of his left arm during battle. And uh, so because of that, because of the remoteness of the island and the, the height of the tower and, and its significance, he was able to get Julia appointed officially as an assistant keeper. And that meant she's on the official log books for the US government and she was picking up a paycheck. So Aaron would have made about $350 a year, Julia maybe 150. Uh, and they lived in the lighthouse and raised their 12, excuse me, their six sons there for 12 years. Um, and Aaron would have relied on Julia quite a bit because uh, if you've ever climbed the top of a tower, uh, particularly a tall one, if you can imagine climbing that while you're carrying a pail of hot oil, which the pail itself weighs about 40 or 50 pounds empty, but you fill it full of hot oil and have to carry it up those spiral stairs and hold on, uh, and you're doing that day in and day out. Well, can you imagine doing that where you only have one hand and you can't really hold on uh, going up or down uh, the tower? And so Julia would have been helpful in a, a variety of capacities in that position for Aaron. Um, in 1878, these two and their youngest son, Robert, who was nine months old, had hired um, this gentleman, Christian Ankerson, who sailed him across to the mainland in Glen Arbor uh, in a boat similar to this Mackinac, which would have been a customary boat for the lighthouse keepers to have on hand. And um, it was March 15th or 16th. So a week ago, Monday, if you think about that. Now this year, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to be out on the water of Lake Michigan in mid-March, but in a typical winter, you're still talking about chunks of ice floating uh, in the waters. 
And on the return trip that day, the boat capsized. And Aaron, with his one arm, which you can see the left arm just kind of hanging there, um, he was unable to save himself or Julia or the baby. And they all drowned that day on the water. Uh, Christian uh, was able to cling to the overturned boat and was rescued the next day. And he did have to issue a statement. And this newspaper article talks about that. Um, but they determined that it was weather related and it was an accident and no one was at fault. So he was not charged with any wrongdoing in the loss of the Sheridans. Uh, the five remaining brothers who ranged in age, I believe from three to 16, 14 or 16, um, they were said to have walked the beach waiting for the bodies to wash ashore, which they never did. And uh, the, the boys then were sent to live with various family members or friends of family um, for the rest of their, until they became adults. Now this is George Sheridan and he was the second oldest son and he went on to become an officially trained lighthouse keeper himself. Served at several lights in Southern Lake Michigan and most notably was at the Kalamazoo River Light, which is this light here um, in Saugatuck. And many people don't even know Saugatuck ever had a lighthouse. Um, it was decommissioned in 1914 and destroyed by a tornado in the 50s. So it is no longer uh, there, although they did build a private cottage on the original foundation out there. And there's a replica of the lighthouse in town as well. Um, so George comes in and he and his wife, Sarah, have three children while they're living in Saugatuck. And in 1914, when they were decommissioning that lighthouse there, um, he was getting ready to transfer to another light and he institutionalized himself. He checked himself into an asylum for depression and for just all of um, the, these issues that he had suffered with his whole life as a result of what happened to his family. And after he got out, he, uh, it was actually Sarah, his wife, who uh, finalized the paperwork to close the lighthouse down in Saugatuck. Um, and after George got out of the asylum, uh, he found out he lost his job at the new light because he didn't apparently didn't show up on as scheduled. Sarah was no longer going to travel with him to his next appointment. She was going to stay in Saugatuck with their children. And he was already unstable with depression and mental illness. And so uh, he ended up going to visit his cousin who was a lighthouse keeper at the Gross Point Light in Evanston, Illinois, and he hung himself there. And it was quite a tragedy for Sarah. Uh, she was left, as I said, she kind of closed up the lighthouse in Saugatuck. And for the next year or so, local lighthouse keepers in the area took up collections to make sure she had money um, to take care of the three children. And she stayed on there. She actually took in laundry to make ends meet. She lived in this house, which is uh, last I knew was still operating as the lighthouse keeper gift shop. And she lived well into her late eighties, had several grandchildren, uh, was well loved and respected in the community. She loved to watch the comings and goings in Saugatuck. And several of the descendants of her family are still in that area. Uh, Jack Sheridan um, is a grandson and uh, he is involved with the Saugatuck Douglas Historical Society. And Stephen Sheridan is, is his brother and Stephen was a judge in Allegan County. And so they, um, they remain very active in keeping the Sheridan family story alive. Uh, this is Sarah Lane and her daughter, Minnie. And Sarah and uh, her husband, John, started out their service at the St. Clair South Channel Range Light <laughs> down in the, um, the St. Clair River area. And they lived in this bigger house, the one on the right, and they would have taken care of both of these lights and thus, they both were recognized in the lighthouse service. And they would have to take a boat across every day to tend to the, to the second light to make sure that it stayed active. And so this allowed for both of them to have a position in the lighthouse service. Um, in 1878, they transferred up to Traverse City to the old Mission Point Lighthouse. And uh, they first served as assistant keepers and then John was promoted in 1883 to the head keeper. But during this time period or shortly after this time period, he became ill. And so Sarah really stepped up and tended to the lighthouse during that time period. And 
in early 1900s during her service, there was this great article from the Grand Rapids News that talked about her life as a keeper. And this is one of several newspaper articles that we'll see. Um, but I think it's a significant thing to note that writers, journalists, the news media of this era felt that the stories about these female keepers were significant to be told. And they ran photographs and they gave great details and, and accounts of what it was like uh, to work at the lighthouse. And in this article, um, Sarah tells a story of one stormy night when she had to go to the top of the tower um, to check on the light to make sure that it was still shining. And if you've ever climbed a lighthouse, you know when you get to the, the top of the stairs, you get to the lantern room and there's a, there's a um, you know, the, the um, metal floor and you've got the trap door that opens and you kind of take your last few steps out of the ladder into the lantern room. And Sarah talked about how somehow that it was so windy that e the wind was still whipping around inside the lantern room for some reason. And as she was making her final climb in, um, she put her hand on the floor. She opened the door, put her hand on the floor to pull herself up and the, the door blew down on her hand. Well, she pushed the door open and made her way up and she tended to the light and took care of everything. And it was a few minutes later before she looked down and realized that there was blood everywhere. And then she determined that she chopped off the tip, top, tip of her finger when the door fell on it. And she says something to the effect of, I, th I think I should have passed away or passed out, uh, but I was so intent on getting my job done that I didn't have time for that. Um, and that just, again, reinforces the level of dedication that these keepers and women particularly um, had it wasn't about themselves. It was about keeping others safe. It was a duty, a call of duty that they had to tend to these lighthouses. All right, this should look familiar to those of you who are actually out on the island. Uh, but the St. James Harbor Light there on Beaver Island uh, has several women tied to it. The earliest would be these beautiful young ladies there in the lower photograph. Um, that is Effie and Mary McKinley. They're the daughters of Peter McKinley, and he was the lighthouse keeper in the 1860s. Um, they were obviously a little older than this at the time that they assisted, but he had poor health at the end of the 60s. And so the girls really helped him with those duties to make sure that they were able to keep their home. When he retired in 1869, Clement Van Riper called, came in as the head keeper. He brought with him his wife, Elizabeth. She was about 23 years old uh, when they uh, started the service. Elizabeth, um, and I'm actually doing significant history, uh, family history on her. She was born on Mackinac Island. Uh, her mother's name was Elizabeth Cross. And uh, Elizabeth Cross's uh, parents died uh, when she was an infant. And she was adopted by an... Um, a man by the name of Michael Dousman. And Michael was uh, very active in the War of 1812. He worked at the Astor Fur Trading Company uh, and was at one point noted as one of the um, richest men on the island, on Mackinac Island, and also had significant property there and in Mackinac City. Um, well, Elizabeth's mother, this Elizabeth's mother, um, eventually got married. Her first husband drowned at sea. And she got married a second time and Elizabeth was the only child born of that marriage. So Elizabeth had three stepbrothers or half brothers, I guess, and then herself. And uh, they ended up moving around a little bit. They went to St. Helena Island and eventually landed on Beaver Island where Elizabeth grew up her um, teenage years and then got married and worked at the lighthouse with Clement. Uh, he was there as the keeper for three years until 1872, when there was a shipwreck out in the harbor of the Thomas Howland. And as that ship was going down, Clement went out to try and help rescue the crew. And in that attempt, he lost his life. His body was also never found. And in her autobiography, A Child of the Sea and Life Among Mormons, Elizabeth mentions um, how there is no greater sorrow than losing your loved one by drowning and never being able to recover the remains. She says it's a sorrow that never ends through life. And because of that situation with Clement, she felt compelled 
to step up and serve as the lighthouse keeper so that no other person would die, hopefully, um, but also after losing her, um, her, I guess her mother's first husband, she lost a brother uh, in a shipwreck and her husband. She didn't want other families to have to go through the tragedy of, of losing someone out on the Great Lakes. And so she received the formal appointment uh, in 1872. And um, she was uh, clearly in charge of her, of her lighthouse. Um, she remarried in 1875, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Williams, who also lived on Beaver Island and uh, was a cooper. He made barrels for the fishermen, the commercial fishermen to send their fish off in. And even after the marriage, Elizabeth retained her position as the head keeper and she and Daniel lived at the lighthouse and they were there until 1884. And at which point she took a transfer to the Little Traverse Lighthouse in Harbor Springs here. It had just been built and she became the very first keeper of this new lighthouse. Um, and she had such a great reputation from her years of service on Beaver Island that there was no hesitation in appointing her to this new lighthouse. Um, she came here and served until 1913. And she retired at the age of 69. Uh, she and Daniel, she had no children with either husband, um, but she and Daniel were quite musical and they would host um, parties, musical parties and concerts inside the lighthouse and on the lawn. Uh, this is in an area of Harbor Springs that is a gated community. It's the Harbor Point area. And so um, they became friendly with a lot of the folks in Harbor Point and uh, they, um, you know, just kind of made their life there. Daniel was also a local photographer and he had a photo studio in Harbor Springs and the Historical Society there in Harbor Springs has several of his uh, photographs as part of their collection. Uh, they decided to retire in uh, 1913 and Elizabeth had served 44 years uh, as a lighthouse keeper between the two lighthouses. Um, and I have been trying for about 10 years now to get her inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, last year, she made it as far as the semifinal round. And my application for her for this year went in a couple of days ago. So hopefully the, when I submitted it, they said, oh, we remember her application from last year. So let's all cross our fingers that we can get her inducted in there um, this, this coming year. Um, after they retired, they ended up moving to Charlevoix. And they lived there until 1938, when they died within 24 hours of each other. I should actually bought a house in Charlevoix. They lived there, but stayed on for quite a few more years. Um, she was 94 years old when she died, and he was a couple of years um, younger than she was. Um, I don't know, I guess it, later on in the 90s during that time period, uh, the fact that they both cause of death with both was listed as senility. I don't know if that was just a standard um, response for that, that age uh, for the deaths, uh, but I had no notification that they had suffered with any ailments up until their final days. Uh, this is the Squaw Point Lighthouse. And uh, this lighthouse was manned by Lemuel Marvin. He was an injured soul, Civil War soldier and a former Baptist minister. Um, and he had only been in his position for six months when he died and his wife, Kate, stepped up into that position. They had 10 children. Uh, five of them were living at the home when she took over the service and she served for six years uh, before she remarried and retired from the lighthouse service. The Sandpoint Lighthouse is in Escanaba, so we're now up technically in the Upper Peninsula. And the first keeper here when the light was, um, was built in 1868 was to be a man by the name of John Terry. He had been appointed during the construction of the light, but he died before it was completed. And so his wife, Mary Terry, was named in his place. Uh, this photograph, the black and white photograph, is believed to be the only picture we have of Mary, of her standing there um, on the porch of the lighthouse. And she served for 18 years, uh, very dedicated, never had an assistant keeper there with her. So she handled all of the duties uh, herself. 
Uh, I believe she owns some land in town as well. And in March, early March of 1886, she lost her life in a tragic fire at the lighthouse. And there are a lot of um, questions about her death. And in fact, it is an unsolved mystery in many cases. Um, the night of the fire it was, uh, I believe, March 5th, uh, 1886. And there was quite a bit of snow on the ground, but the fire started in the middle of the night, just after midnight. And after the embers had cooled, they found her body in the basement. And they thought it was very suspicious that in the middle of the night, she would be in the basement. If she knew the fire was um, going, why didn't she just vacate the building? And there are some people, and it was noted in some early newspaper articles, that believe, that believe she was actually murdered. Um, when the fire was extinguished the next morning, this door here to the lower level, uh, they determined had been kicked in. It was off of its hinges, kicked in. And what they some suspect happened was in the middle of the night, she heard that happen. She heard somebody kick the door in and with an attempt to rob her. She came downstairs from the second story uh, bedroom, which would be um, one of these upper windows here. And um, she heard this, she heard that she went downstairs. There was a struggle with the intruder. She was killed and the fire was started to make it look like she died accidentally. And even Michigan History Magazine put together a whole newspaper article uh, or magazine article all about this situation and the um, suspicions that they had about her death. Um, there was never any uh, real investigation. There were never any real suspects, um, but they really do believe that, or some people really do believe that, that there was foul play at hand. Um, we believe she's buried in an unmarked grave next to her husband. Um, and they're trying to raise money, I believe, to uh, put a uh, headstone there for her, but still remains an unsolved mystery in Escanaba. Okay, we're gonna travel outside of Michigan momentarily because the family I'm gonna introduce you to next um, actually worked in the Apostle Islands, which is in Wisconsin, but they ended up in some of the lighthouses in Michigan and on Lake Superior as well. And their story is a pretty interesting one. So this is the Michigan Island Lighthouse. And this is where Anna Maria Carlson, who was the wife of Robert Carlson, lived. And they had three children. This is Cecilia, and then the twin boys, Robert and Carl. And one winter, they decided that they were gonna stay on the island instead of going to the mainland to ride out the winter. And uh, there's a, an article that, Anna did an interview she did with the media in the 1930s, which talks about this particular story I'm gonna tell you. And in that, she says that she thought she'd be okay because they had a hired girl that was gonna stay on and help with the children and the housekeeping and the, the, uh, the animals and whatnot. But the hired girl went ashore with some fishermen and never came back. So poor, poor Anna Maria was left there to take care of the children all on her own. And she was a Chicago girl. So she really, I don't know that she ever really settled in to island life in Lake Superior, particularly during the winter months. Now this is an, another island in the general vicinity. And I show this because it shows you what winter, a traditional winter in the Apostle Islands looked like in that era. Um, and this is gonna come into account with, with this story. So they decide to stay on one winter and um, the men, uh, her brother-in-law, Robert's brother was a keeper, assistant keeper. And they decided this one day that they were gonna go out fishing. And it's the middle of winter and a storm comes up. Well, they're standing on the edge of the ice there on Michigan Island when a chunk of the ice breaks off and they drift down to Madeline Island. Well, Anna Maria doesn't know this. All she knows is that they don't come home at the end of the night and they don't come home the next night and they don't come home the next night. And she's trying to figure out how to get by and she's at her wits end and she's trying to figure out how to milk the cow, which she doesn't know how to do and take care of the children and, and 
you know, the fear of what's going to happen to them stranded out on this island for the rest of the winter if they don't have anyone that can provide for them uh, as her husband and brother-in-law would do. Well, the fourth day, the men made it back. And what they determined was, or they, they floated away to Madeline Island and it was eight miles. And they actually had to find, uh, they found an abandoned boat on Madeline Island and it had a hole in it. So they had to patch it up. They had to find stuff on the island and patch it up. And they rowed across eight miles of, of icy, frigid waters and the wind back to Michigan Island and to the family. And upon their retirement in the 1930s, um, Elizabeth, or excuse me, Anna Maria tells this story to the Detroit News, and it's actually the full page and then some on the inside of this particular section uh, about the terror that um, that kind of stuck with them. And, and it was a, it was a situation that she really clung to most of her life. And in fact, I think her daughter Cecilia, who was only three at the time. Um, carried, you know, she had some lingering effects from that traumatic experience uh, out there on the island. Now, the Carlsons went from Michigan Island over to Marquette. They served here uh, from 1898 until 1903. And then they served their last years from, um, from 1903 to 1931 until they retired at Whitefish Point. And at this point, they were also raising their grandchildren here. This is Bertha and Robert. And those are Cecilia's children. Uh, Cecilia was a teenage bride and she married a man um, in town and they had um, Bertha and then they got divorced and then somehow they got remarried and then they had Robert. And I don't know if they ever divorced a second time, but what I do know is that Cecilia spent the last 18 years of her life at the asylum in Newberry. And I don't know why she was sent there. Um, of course, back um, in the early 1900s, you could get sent to an asylum for something like postpartum depression um, or for arguing with your husband too much. So I don't really know what happened. I just know that she seemed to have a very traumatic uh, early life, and then her teenage years weren't so great, and then she died in the asylum of tuberculosis. Um, so Anna Maria and Robert raised these grandchildren, and Bertha lived on into her 90s, and she uh, was very involved at Whitefish Point. She was involved in the restoration. She worked with the group that brought in the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society, which is there, and the Shipwreck Museum. Of course, this is where the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. Um, and if you go through the lighthouse itself, you'll find several items of the uh, Carlson family, the um, artifacts and, and memorabilia from her family that she donated to the museum uh, for them to have on display there. So even in her final days, um, she wrote a book about her life there and everything. She was incredibly dedicated to that light. And they say her ghost, uh, the ghost of a young girl they believe to be Bertha, is still in existence at Whitefish Point. Um, in the Keweenaw Peninsula, so we're gonna backtrack a little bit uh, geographically to pick up a couple lighthouses, um, but this is the Eagle Harbor Range Light. And Mary A. Wheatley uh, was married to William Henry Wheatley. He was the keeper of the nearby Granite Island Lighthouse. He then transferred to Marquette, but he died with his boat capsized in Lake Superior in 1898. And about six weeks later, Mary was appointed as the keeper of the Eagle Harbor Range Light, and she served there until 1905. Uh, this is the Manitou Light, also in Lake Superior, and the Gull Rock Lighthouse. And uh, the Corgan, uh, James Corgan, and a couple of his kids, and I believe he had a brother, kind of went back and forth between several of these different lighthouses um, during the 1870s and 1880s. And uh, James was married to Mary and she was an assistant keeper, helped him out with several of the duties. And years ago, when I was gathering information from the Keweenaw Land Trust, including these photos, um, I received a really nice email back. And it turns out that the gentleman who was helping me was a descendant of the family. And so he told this interesting story to me about the birth of their second oldest son, James, who they called Bud. 
he was born in 1875. And apparently Mary um, was out on uh, one of the islands and needed to go to the mainland to give birth. So they fixed up the boat, they put a, um, a mattress in there and blankets and pillows and they got her all comfortable and they were taking her back to Copper Harbor um, where a midwife would be there to help her deliver the baby. Well, the baby was born on the way to the mainland. So Mary instructed them to turn the boat around and take her back to the lighthouse. Um, so she did that. And I like to think she probably made dinner for everybody at the end of the day as well. So uh, she went on to have a couple of more children um, and then died in 1893. This is another exciting one. Um, this is relatively new to the presentation. Um, for years, I had heard about this woman named Henrietta Berg and the Bay Degree Bay Lighthouse, which is also in the Keweenaw Peninsula. And Henrietta was an unofficial keeper of an unofficial light. And what I mean by that is that this is the house that she and her husband lived in. And uh, her husband was a fisherman. In fact, they owned an island off of um, off of the mainland that was called Berg Island. Today it is known as Rabbit Island. And when her husband would go out fishing, he would ask her to put a lantern uh, in the upper window here of their house so that when he would return from fishing, he would know where the light was, the house was because of the light and he would be able to return to her safely. Well, it didn't take long before the other fishermen in town figured out this game. And so they would say, Henrietta, we're going out fishing. Will you put the light out for us? So she just started putting it out every night. And she kept those fishermen safe as they went out at night uh, out of Bay Gree. Um, and so this was before a lighthouse was even constructed um, in this area. But finally, they did build the, um, the Mendota Lighthouse in 1895. And uh, this light actually was up for sale last year. And I don't know what the sales price was or what the, you know, what the final selling price was, but it was listed at $495,000. Uh, they did build a new website. I was just on that a couple of weeks ago. And there's a note on there that says, if you're going through the area and you're interested in a tour to drop them an email. And if they're around, they'll schedule a chance for you to go through the lighthouse. Uh, now we're back to Marquette Harbor Lighthouse. And in addition to the um, Carlson's, well before the Carlson's, in fact, during the 1860s, we had Anastasia Truckee. And she served from 1861 to 1865 while her husband Nelson there was off serving in the Civil War. And uh, she was very well respected in the community. She had uh, befriended the Native Americans in the Marquette area. And she um, had a visiting relative, in fact, who came in. And then this is a letter that I received, a copy of a letter I received in 2001 from a descendant written to her by another descendant. Um, and it, in this, it talks about how a relative went to visit one day and because there was a disagreement, Anastasia had to kind of come in and settle down this argument between one of the Native American men and her male relative. But as a result of her, um, of her diplomacy, I suppose, uh, the relative was allowed to keep his scalp. And that just really enforced the level of respect that she had in the community. Uh, they, the Native Americans called her mother of the light. Uh, she and Nelson had a couple of children, including Frances Emma Truckee. She married Alex Shanley. And uh, Chris Shanley Dillman, who if I go back to this letter, she was the great, great, great granddaughter of Anastasia. Uh, Chris actually wrote a book uh, called Finding My Light. And it is about a teenage girl named Emma Truckee who grows up at a lighthouse in Marquette while her father's off fighting in the Civil War. So a historical novel based on a true story of the Dillman family, or of the um, Bucky family. And now we are on over to Lake Huron to our final few lighthouses. This is the old Presque Isle Lighthouse. Uh, this light only served for about th 30 years. 
before it was decommissioned and they built a taller light um, closer to the water in a better position uh, just up the peninsula. And at this point, this light was private property and it was going to be converted into a cottage and ultimately ended up becoming a museum. Now, the last family to serve as keepers of the old Presqueel Lighthouse was Mary and Patrick Garrity. So Mary is the mother, she's there on the left. Patrick was the father. And they had, I believe, four sons and two daughters. And of that, three sons and one daughter followed their uh, into the lighthouse service. Anna Garrity worked primarily at the range lights in Presqueel. Um, and as did one of her brothers, uh, her brothers, John, Patrick, and Thomas all served as keepers. Um, and then they also transferred on to the new lighthouse. In the 1960s, uh, or late 60s, early 70s, until the 1990s, the museum was staffed by Lorraine Paris and her, so, uh, her husband, George. So she would be a modern day lighthouse keeper, or at least a curator of the, the building. At the point that they were there, there was no uh, lantern room. It had been removed from that old Presqueel light and there was no electricity, no um, electrical anything. They eventually rebuilt it on there as they opened it up as a, a greater museum. And I met Lorraine the first time, probably pushing 20 years ago. She was at the Great Lakes Lighthouse Festival in Alpena. Um, I was a speaker. As, as, as was she, and we got to sit together at um, dinner and chat about stories. And then several years ago, I gave a presentation about Michigan Taunted Lighthouses on the lawn there at the old Presqueel Light. And Lorraine was in the front row because she had told me stories about her husband, George's ghost, who had made many appearances to her during the years that she stayed following his death. Now, this is the new Presqueel light. This is the one that they built just up the uh, peninsula. And so Aunt, uh, Mary and Patrick Garrity, the mother and father, were the last keepers at the old light and the first keepers at the new light. And uh, the children often kind of rotated back and forth. They really did operate it as a family business in this community um, where the three brothers, the sister, and then the mom and dad would kind of go back and forth uh, they had their own official responsibilities, but they were always willing to help each other out in the cause. Further down the coastline, this is the Saginaw River Rear Range Lighthouse. And the very first lighthouse keeper here was a man by the name of Peter Braun. Uh, Peter's in the center there. Uh, and in the group photo, Peter is also in the center. And then his wife, Julia Toby, is directly in front of him. They had a couple of children and their youngest was this man, his name was DeWitt Braun. And uh, Peter fell ill shortly after they got to the lighthouse in 1866. And for seven years, Julia stepped up and was the unofficial keeper, not only taking care of her ailing husband, uh, but also taking care of the light every day. And DeWitt did help. He was a teenager at the time that that service started. Um, and so he was instrumental in assisting his mother whenever he could. Um, Peter died in 1873. And a couple of years later, Julia remarried in what the locals tell me was a scandalous marriage in that her new husband, George Way, was 13 years younger than she was. Um, but uh, she took on the position. He it remained in the position. He moved into the lighthouse. However, they eventually... Um, put him in as the head keeper and demoted her. And then a couple of years after that, in 1882, they, had, they abolished the assistant keeper position altogether. Well, after that happened, um, George uh, actually passed away and she and DeWitt had to leave the lighthouse service. And then following that, they put both the head and the assistant keepers back in place. And I always wondered um, if they were trying to force her out there at the very end of her service. Um, but she passed away in 1889 and is buried in a cemetery in Bay City um, in between both of her husbands. So that's got to be a, a cozy little situation there. Uh, the Point Barks Lighthouse is where our first female keeper in Michigan hails from. 
And this pencil drawing is what the early lighthouse looked like in 1849 when Catherine Shook lived at the light with her husband, Peter, and their eight children. And on this particular night, uh, Peter had um, gone to Port Huron to get the doctor, to fetch the doctor because Catherine was feeling ill. And after she was treated, they tried to convince the doctor to spend the night at the lighthouse and Peter would take him back home the next day. Well, the doctor insisted that he had to go home that evening because he had patients to see in the morning. And because it was faster to travel by water, Peter got into his boat and he started to take the doctor back to Port Huron. Well, the boat capsized and Peter and the doctor, Dr. Heath, both drowned that day and they did not find either body. So at that point, um, Catherine was named the head keeper. And a couple of weeks after that accident, maybe six weeks after that accident, there was a severe fire at the lighthouse. She was injured um, and it put them out of the house itself. It did not do any damage to the, to the um, tower. Um, but this is a letter from the inspector who showed up and basically said that it was a chimney fire. It was not her fault. You know, please get out here and fix it promptly. Um, and while you're there, paint the uh, tower of the, the lighthouse tower as well. Um, but she ended up staying on at the light uh, for several more years until she ended up passing away. Um, as I mentioned, they never found Peter's body, but he is listed on her headstone uh, at the cemetery in New Baltimore. And then our final light today uh, is one, another one that I've known about for quite some time. And other than having the lighthouse keeper's name, the female keeper's name, I really had very little information. Well, in the last couple of weeks, I tracked down some very fascinating details uh, on this particular lighthouse. Now, the Mama Judah light is no longer standing. It was on an island uh, called the Mama Judah Island, but also uh, at one point in um, the 1700s listed on French maps as Jones Island. Um, and one of the noted families that was tied to that was the Litigat family. Uh, these are brothers and sisters. So Safario was the oldest brother, John and Barney, and then their youngest sister, Mary. And as the story goes, um, their mother, died in childbirth, giving birth to Mary. And I haven't been able to actually track down the mother, the, the parents' names yet. Their father um, was a prosperous farmer and he ended up sending Mary out and, and actually um, she was adopted by another family um, because he was a, a busy farmer and he had three boys and, and what was he going to do to take care of an infant, a newborn girl? Um, but she did... I think still maintain a relationship um, with her father um, and her brothers. There's not much I could find. Uh, Zachariah, I found a newspaper article where he sued some man for stealing his wife. Um, John and Barney were noted as Civil War soldiers. Uh, Barney actually got married to a woman named Caroline Amelia Taylor um, and then ended up serving in the Civil War. John Litigat died during their first battle in the war, but Barney went on to serve um, in several battles, including um, Cold Harbor and Gettysburg, where he lost some fingers on his right hand. Um, but after he mustered out in uh, 1865 as a sergeant, he returned to Michigan as a farmer, a husband, and a father. And he and Caroline had five children, but only two lived into adulthood. And in 1873, Barney became appointed as the head keeper of the Mama Judah Lighthouse. However, he died nine months later. And so Caroline, Caroline Litigod, his wife, his widow, became the lighthouse keeper. And uh, he actually um, is buried uh, in the Sand Hill Cemetery or the Oakdale Cemetery in uh, um, Taylor Township in Wayne County. And it even mentions his service in Gettysburg on this historical marker um, in the uh, cemetery there. Uh, Caroline remarried um, and served at the White House uh, for about 11 more years, and she died in 1903 and is buried at the Woodmere Cemetery in Detroit. 
But I want to go back to Mary, little sister Mary Littigat. It's, it was said that she was just a young girl when she first saw a man by the name of William Smith Ford, who at times worked for her husband or for her father, excuse me, and later acquired some of her father's acreage. He would eventually marry Mary in 1861, and they had five children, their firstborn, Henry Ford. So I always thought that I just thought that it was so fascinating that our female lighthouse keeper and her husband were the aunt and uncle of auto magnet Henry Ford. And what an interesting connection back to that family. Now, if you're interested in additional stories, and there are many others, uh, here are some books of interest. The first one that I read that really got me into the female stories was Women Who Kept the Lights on the Top Row. Um, that's written by a mother-daughter team of Clifford, and they actually manage um, a very uh, detailed archive website on uh, U.S. lighthouses. And then we have a bunch of other books here. The Elizabeth Whitney's biography, A Child of the Sea and Life Among Mormons. I actually acquired a first edition of that a couple of years ago online, and it's one of my most treasured possessions. There's also a book about Elizabeth Whitney Williams in the Little Traverse Light. It's a children's book. And I've just ordered a copy of that. I've got a one-year-old granddaughter now. So someday that'll be in her library. And then several years ago, actually, when I was looking to put Elizabeth into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, I met Pat Major, who was running the um, museum in Lansing, and they were doing an exhibit on female lighthouse keepers. And she then was researching a book and asked me if she could borrow the name or use the name of my program for her book. And I actually shared with her a variety of my um, research. And you'll notice the cover has Beaver Island and Elizabeth right on it. And uh, so she's done a phenomenal job and, and dug up even more than what I had about Michigan women in the lighthouse service. Um, as I mentioned, I wrote a book called Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses. And ironically, I wasn't determined to do this, but seven of the 13 chapters in my book have to do with female lighthouse keepers. So their ghosts are just as prevalent as the men, which I guess is ironic in a way. Uh, and so this book has even more stories about some of our female keepers and some of their spirited activity. And then if you're looking for more information on lighthouses and lighthouse keeper services in Michigan or throughout the country, these three websites are uh, the ones I use regularly. And I'll put these in the chat in addition to that video of um, Francis Johnson from What's My Line. And then I'll put also the link in there um, if anybody's interested in purchasing an autographed copy of my book, I'll get those out as well. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and we can, I'll stop the screen share and we can open it up to chat questions or uh, conversations. I'm open to all of that. And I really appreciate you guys taking the afternoon to uh, let me share some of my stories with you. Well, thanks, Diana. That was really great. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Um, I'll start with the first question, and then I would encourage the others, if you want to ask a question, um, you can tap. There's an emotions icon that's below the screen and raise your hand, and then I'll just call on you, and you can ask your question. So, you know, be ready to unmute your microphone so we can all hear your question. So my first question for you, Diana, is of all of the women that you've talked about and their histories, is there one that stands out that um, you really, you know, think a lot about, or, you know, just there's one spectacular female lighthouse keeper for Women's History Month? I honestly, and I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you from Beaver <laughs> Island, but Elizabeth really, her story has been with me for a long, long time. Um, I think it was one of the reasons that I first made a trip to Beaver Island uh, when I was at West Michigan Tourist Association back in the late 90s. Um, because of her longevity, you know, 44 years, two different lights, um, and her reasonings for doing it were to protect other people. I just really thought she was um, a very honorable woman. And that's one of the reasons that I've been working so diligently over the year, years to, um, to get her into the Hall of Fame, just so that more people can recognize her contributions um, 
you know, to that. Um, you know, I think some of the other women who also were mothers and had to take care of the light and an ailing husband and all the children, I think there's a lot to be said about that as well. Um, they were, you know, multitasking wasn't a definition back then, but I think that they really gave an example of what that was and the dedication uh, that they had for all of their services. Um, but I think each one of them has just such a unique attribute and an interesting story, even if they only stayed in the position, a couple of them only a couple of weeks, just long enough to find um, other, other housing or other options um, after their husbands passed away. Okay, I see we have a question here. Oh, well, I'll, does anybody have any questions for Diana? Oh, and I, I did put all those links in there. So if you get a chance, you can click on them now and open them up in your browser and you can always look at them later. Um, but the uh, What's My Line is kind of funny, especially if you're not familiar with that TV show at all. Uh, it was really quite entertaining to watch, um, watch that whole thing. And I was looking for that for years because they started putting back issues, episodes online and hers didn't show up for quite a while. And I stumbled on it about two and a half years ago. So it was when you find, when you're a researcher and you find something you've been looking for for a long time, you get very excited about that. We have a question from Anna Rose. Anna? Hi, thanks so much for doing this talk. This is really interesting. Um, I did have one question. Um, I'm curious if you have any recommended resources for learning more about like the day-to-day -day life of um, these women lighthouse keepers um, of like 1800s and 1900s. Um, many of the books will talk about their, their daily duties, but basically they would get up very early in the morning um, and they would have to check the tower. So these early lighthouses operated with whale oil or lard later with kerosene before they became automated. So they would have to go up several times a, year, a day, make sure that there was fuel in that, like a kerosene lantern would have, prim the wick, polish the Fresnel lens, which is that really thick glass lens. Um, and actually I took a picture of one of them at Belle Isle yesterday. So I need to probably add that to the program. Uh, they would have to polish the lens. They would have to polish the glass of the, of the lantern room because if you burn any of those oils, of course, it puts soot out there. Um, they would have had to take care of the house on a daily basis, the, the yard, the garden, the chickens, the children. The house had to be inspected and cleaned all the time because um, if a surprise inspection by a lighthouse server, um, lighthouse um, serviceman showed up and the house was in disarray, they would get penalized for that. And they also had to cater to tourism. Uh, to tourists back in the day. Because these are government buildings, if you were visiting, let's say Beaver Island, and you walked by the lighthouse, Peter McKinley or the girls or Elizabeth and her husband, they had to let you check out the lighthouse. It's They were they were renting it or borrowing it. It was government property. Not at all that they could necessarily have to let them in the lantern room, but they certainly would have to... Um, to be courteous and respectful for those tourists that would come along. So they were on the clock pretty regularly from um, about this time of year, depending on the weather and the snow and ice until December and when the shipping season was taking place. Now those lanterns also had to be monitored during the night. So often um, if you had an assistant keeper, you would take turns. Um, but that you'd have to get up once or twice in the middle of the night to make sure that that light was still going, particularly during stormy weather. And also they would have had to be responsible in part for life-saving efforts as with Clement who died there on Beaver Island, you know, he had to go out and help rescue that ship in distress. Uh, there are accounts of some of the women having to step up and do that, although not nearly as often as the men. That's really oh, interesting. That's interesting. Thanks so much. Hopefully, you know, it's funny because people look at um, 
people look at it and go, oh, how romantic to live in a lighthouse and you get the sunrises and the sunsets until you think about, you got to climb that tower four or five times a day. The women wore dresses still, long black dresses. They didn't have a, uh, a uniform like the men. Um, so you're hiking up your skirt. You probably got a little bit of a heel in your boot back in those days. And you're tending to all of those duties in, in a physically demanding job. I would imagine they had really good calves from all of the trips up and down the lighthouse <laughs> tower. They probably, they probably had good muscles too. So um, the books that are in that uh, mentioned, they have um, through local libraries, often you can get them on um, interlibrary loan. Um, the Elizabeth's book is in reprint. You can get like a Google reprint of it fairly inexpensively. Uh, and I have had one of those for years until I stumbled on um, the, um, the first edition of that. Um, but most of them, a lot of like Fred Stonehouse's books, The Ladies of the Lights, those are, um, those are available pretty regularly. Chris Shanley Dillman's is hard to find. Um, and that's the one I've been trying to get a hold of as well. So I email her and her email doesn't work anymore. So I don't know where she's at. Okay, well, thanks so much. I seen a hand raise. Janelle, did you wanna ask a question? Oh yeah, thanks Lori. Um, thank you so much for this presentation, Diane, especially for Women's History Month. I think that's awesome. And my question is, you know, it seems like this agency is really receptive to the idea of women in this role compared to maybe other agencies. Do you have any background on that or how that came to be? You know, I don't really know um, why the Lighthouse Service was so open to it versus others. I mean, you did have female um, postmistresses, uh, you had female teachers, which were kind of a government job. Um, but that's about it. And, and I really don't know how it came to be. I don't think it was like any big uh, petition or anything like that to get them in. I think they just, maybe these women just proved themselves because they came in at the as an assistant to the husbands in most cases. Very rarely did you have a female come in solely on her own into that position. One, we did have one in Michigan City, Indiana. However, her name was Harriet Colfax and her cousin was Skylar Colfax, the vice president. So I think she probably used that to her advantage um, to get into the lighthouse. Um, but yeah, I don't really know. I, I, I haven't found any records that, that like there's a handbook that says women can have this job if they're qualified. I think it, it's just one of those things that happened and, and here we are telling the stories years later. Thank you for that answer, Diana. Well, if there are no other questions, and I don't see any other hands raised. I'd like to say thank you for joining us um, on this afternoon and happy spring to you and everyone else on the computer today. And hopefully we'll do another one maybe next year when I have all of my Elizabeth stuff around and, and we can announce that she's in the Hall of Fame. You know, we'll do a whole celebration about it. Yeah, and I look forward to having you visit on Beaver Island. Yes, we're looking forward to getting back. We didn't make it there last year, but we try to get over there, even if it's a, just a day trip. Yes. Well, thank you, that's everyone. it for us then, everybody. Have a good day, and thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you.